welcome to File Exchange. Uh, Colette Robbins and I are both digital slash analog sculptors. We organize twice a month, thereabouts, uh, chats with artists and also writers and curators. And the focus of our conversations is anybody working with 21st century um, new digital tools for art making. Yeah. Excellent. And today, this episode, we have Patty Johnson. And we're super excited to have Patty. She, I've known Patty for quite a while, uh, probably about 12 years now. Um, and Patty is a pillar of the contemporary art world community. Um, she's an award winning writer who founded the contemporary art blog, Art F City, from 2005 to 2018. And this blog, along with her community centered character, has carved out new spaces for new types of art criticism, which I've really admired. Um, and she's helped launch the careers of many artists, including Petra Courtright. And Patty has uh, cut through the bullshit of the art world by creating her own platform called A Workshop, um, which is a training hub for arts professionals. Um, she's also the co-host of Explain Me podcast with William Pauita, uh, which discusses art, money, and politics. So thank you so much for joining us, Patty. Yeah, thank uh, you. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for um, having me on the show. I really, I'm, I'm really excited to dig into your all work today. And I wanted to make a mention actually that um, your work at Spring Break came up in the latest Explain Me episode that we are editing yeah. at this moment. So oh, both like William and I independently had your booth on our list of noteworthy uh, booths at spring break. So although the, although the fair is closed, I do believe you can still purchase things through the website. Yes, yes, yeah, yes you can there. until December. Yeah. So you can go to spring break art show and purchase work from our booth, from the other booths. Yeah, no, thank you so much. Um, so Sophie was gonna, we're gonna dig a little bit into Patty, your background. Um, and I, I, before we started recording, we just brought up the article that you wrote in 2015 about predictions for the digital art world, which is gonna really relate with this conversation that we're having. Um, and one of the things I noticed in this article was you were talking about new ink takes shape and you were saying that um, they have an app that allows you to flip through images the same way you might on Tinder, that is quickly, and favorite them and buy them through the gallery. And that's just, that to me was like definitely a, a prediction for what we're going through right now with NFTs and with Twitter and with Instagram and how art is being purchased online and, you know, a much you know, much more often than it was online, you know, yeah, like even a couple of years ago. Galleries being down and people overwhelmingly seeing art on a screen and maybe even on their mobile device screen and this year more than ever. So, yeah. You, you know, it's funny because like um, on that list, I had also mentioned um, the dealer, Stefan Simchowitz. Mm -hmm. um, and I think he was under the heading of Stefan Simchowitz stirs some shit because that <laughs> yeah. is sort of, what he was known to do but yeah. i had organized a panel with him or well i was on a panel with him through artnet um at one of these fairs a while back and he had um just like zoomed in um so we saw him on like and mm -hmm. <laughs> there's like everybody's small head and then like stefan's like yeah. giant screen and yeah. he was talking about how he collected digital artists, which at that time mm -hmm. wasn't that long ago. It was 2014, 2015. It's like, and here's my binder of artists mm. in this. And they were all, they were, it was a binder of certificates of authenticity. And he had several of them. And this is, this had come up in our conversation in your mm. booth that like one of the things that NFTs did seem to, solve for any you know would-be collector was it did take away the necessity of having these giant binders of certificates yeah, of authenticity it's actually away. an easier way to collect for those who do it yeah yeah absolutely 
Definitely. Yeah. No. And, and it's interesting. You have also talked, you know, you've written a lot about um, artists like net artists, like early on and what kind of drew you into that? Like, how did you start kind of getting more tapped into those artists practices when they were, it was not on trend in the art world. It was not like this, this big, you know, thing that all the other writers were writing about. Well, I think partially it was, um, I don't know if there's a good way to say it, but like ease perhaps, like I really liked that I was already on the computer and then there was art on my computer that was meant to be seen on the computer. I didn't have to go anywhere for it. Mm -hmm. Um, And I spent a lot of time like, you know, doing sort of DIY websites and things like that, um, especially in the early days of the blog. So, you know, and I'm not somebody who's particularly technologically inclined. I'm the type of person that needs like, if there are three remote controls, I need to hire somebody with an engineering degree to figure it out. Like this is is not me, you know? My husband's an engineer, he works the remote. (laughs) (laughs) He works the remote. But I did find that like figuring out like sort of basic problems online, so long as I wasn't like figuring out like the sort of structural engineering of a website was fine and I actually enjoyed it. So I really kind of enjoyed um, seeing how artists in that medium solve problems because um, I felt like usually it was sort of an indicator of how people were really using technology. And if you could kind of connect um, with the uh, with the with the medium in that way, it told you a lot of things, not just about the art, but like, um, but about technology and like what it means in our lives. Like, you know, I think I was the oh. first person to write about Petra Courtright's um, video. She had this like webcam video where she's just like yeah. using these little. They weren't emoji at that time. They were like pizza stickers and things like oh, that, yeah. and. I remember, first of all, I wrote about it like I knew what the hell she was doing. I really did not. Like, (laughs) you know, I was figuring it out like everybody else. Under the hood. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I was figuring it out like everybody else. And like the thing that I think was kind of nice about this is like, so was she. You know, you could kind of see it in the way that she was experimenting with these different stickers. Um, and she's somebody who I happen to think like there's, um, you can't, well, now you can monetize a lot more, but like she has, she has a, just a real facility with like digital iconography and stickers that I think like most people just don't have. Mm. So it's, you know, it's really exciting to see, um, you know, I think there's a lot of sort of grousing about um nfts and how much terrible artwork is kind of attached to them which of course is true Mm -hmm. um that is a problem and it sort of reflects i think other issues in the culture um that have to do with not having um a structure well real means of critical evaluation Uh of, of things like culturally we we no longer can evaluate evaluate clearly what's good for us and what's what's Absolutely. good and what's not. And we Absolutely. see that on the political end of things, we see it yeah. very pernicious ways. Like, well, you know, people can't, they can't health. figure out how to take vaccine. And, you know, in the cultural realm, what we see yeah. is like a whole bunch of garbage flooding the market in ways that I think yeah. are fundamentally different than they were previously. You know, it's one yeah. thing to have some bad art out there that's always going to be the case it's another thing mm, to have quite a discourse to yeah be limited in its ability well, to i mean it's a very i wonder what's going to happen i've been thinking a lot about this because you know you know the people sale and you know you think about the kind of you know the most kind of egregious parts of the art world and you know the kind of capitalist outposts of it and and you think about how they've kind of co-opted the the most um, prominent NFT artists and like made a lot of money off of it. So it's like, it's really hard to separate like that from the art world anyways, because I feel like it's just like kind of an extension of the art world, but at the same time, and then there's like 
there's something really amazing about no critical structures being in place because there is an openness and anybody can make and anybody, but then there's something also really difficult is how do you find engaging work that's like trying to talk about something and using this medium in an interesting way. So there's all of these components happening where you see, and we were talking about this yesterday, Sophie and I, where people from um, in countries where there's a lot of conservative um, ideas are feeling this freedom in NFTs as a way to express themselves and connect with another community and they're forming um, DAOs and, um, uh, you know, different communities to create their works. Yeah. 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 As financial support. Yeah. That's like, I find, I mean, I, I'm hoping more people go into that space and start navigating that like curators, writers, art critics like and start being more open to this space as something that the serious medium um are all works serious obviously not but like you know like but in terms of is it a is it a medium that is going to be sticking around i think it's going to be a medium that maybe has different iterations i think blockchain's never going anywhere i mean it's not going anywhere but um so i think that should be interesting too what the curation's like and that was kind of just to like bring it back to what our booth was in spring break in terms of why we ended up yeah. to do the different components in the booth that we did and why we chose to do NFTs. Um, and you want me to share, I can start our slide show. Yeah. Um, all right. Let me. Oh, that'd just, be fantastic. Yeah, I can flick through some um, some imagery uh, from the booth. Um, because for those of you who don't know who are watching, Sophie and I, we do come from more of the traditional art world background. Um, I started out as a painter um, initially and got into technology much later. And and um, and so, oh, that's a beautiful. I haven't seen this photo yet. And oh, this is my cell phone panorama that I did look five minutes before the install. We should should we introduce the show very quickly? Yeah. So yeah. Excited. Just um, this is an exhibition, a booth within Spring Break. Uh, the title was Chapel, curated by M. Charlene Stevens. Um, Colette and I had, we had been in dialogue. I mean, the genesis of our YouTube channel is that we were like best Zoom buddies. <laughs> <laughs> Throughout, really through the pandemic, we'd had so many discussions around our work. Um, and brought in other artists. We did a lot of these three-person calls too with artists working in 3D. So it, we really wanted to show together. Spring Break seemed like a nice kind of launch pad to do that show. Um, we, don't, we don't collaborate on our work, but there is an awful lot of dialogue and back and forth around the pieces. And we'd seen these pieces evolve and had conversations. I'd seen this one, you know, growing in Colette's studio and, and vice versa with my new work. So there was so much back and forth. And... We, um, we brought in Charlene, who, speaking of the role of the curator, Colette, we were talking about the, the value that she brought to this, which was to frame the exhibition. She called it Chapel. Um, her thesis was that the theme of Spring Break this year was hearsay heresy. And her thesis was that the heretics were now the ones in power, that the cult leaders were the ones running the country. Um, she looked at the more historical um, theoretical and uh, kind of maybe the more open and broad intuitive concerns that Colette and I were looking at in both of our works um, and she wanted she contextualized it within the current political climate and particularly looking at religious ecstasy in my work at um, the kind of the idea of like the false idol and the the icons that Colette is creating and we can we can talk more about that as we go through but For that those was Sorry to interrupt. For those who don't know, I think maybe it would be useful to sort of identify which um, artworks here, who's, who's doing what. Yeah, oh, yes, absolutely. Here, I'll, I'll pop back to the, the individual works. Sorry, these are some oh, here we are. images mm -hmm. of the booth. Um, so, yeah, so these are, these are all captioned and these just alternate through. I just wanted to just set the scene a little bit. Um, we are all the work that was shown was almost exclusively 3D printed sculpture. Uh, almost all life size, I'd say anything dealing with the human form was life size. 
And we also, in within the exhibition, we had wallpaper based on vector drawings of our sculptures. And we had video works that were sold as NFTs on the foundation platform. So there were three different ways of materializing uh, forms, but they actually all, it all came from some of the same 3D models that Colette and I have both been working with for a long time. So the exhibition was this kind of multiplicity. It was a bit, a bit of a, you know, a digital metaverse as a way of rendering these few sculptures that we were showing. Yeah. Yes. And I can show the video as well, just while we're talking. Yeah, yes. Uh, Wallpaper. Um, all right, so this was my video work, which was a 60 second fly through. And this, you start out with a bird's eye view and end up with a bug's eye uh, of the large sculpture that sat in the center of the room. And this video actually is all the polygons of that sculpture. So it's sort of almost an engineering blueprint. And um, it imagines this monumental body that was held up by this forest of computer generated supports and kind of cites it in an actual forest of made from that imagery. So the viewer walks underneath as if it were a very large public monument and then zooms back up. And so these were shown on monitors within the booth and I'll show Colette's video work also. Colette, if you wanna talk a little about yours. Yeah, no, so mine is definitely taking that idea of the metaverse, and I was just really captivated by the conversations around NFTs as these kind of collectibles that then could become part of your metaverse collection. So when we're all in the metaverse, that you these NFTs you've been working hard to collect are going to be present in that new simulated space. So it reminded me of, you know, in Egypt, like um, kind of, creating all of these um, icons and images to take with you to the afterlife. And so I wanted to make this, this video feel like you were taking my kind of false idols and icons and, and going through a journey with them through to the metaverse. So the metaverse is like a future iteration of the internet, is that? So the metaverse is, it was a, it, one of the original one was uh, the, the novel that kind of got the idea of the metaverse going where we all have VR headsets and we're all in this simulated world together and we're no like the physical, our physical existence and how we interact with the physical space is not where things happen, but rather when you put that headset on and you have your avatar and you go into that world. So then NFTs would be in your simulated art collection. Does that make sense? Got okay. it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, it becomes a part of your environment. Yeah. Um, I can stop the share for now. We can return to particular works. Colette, do you want me to leave it running or come back to? Um, no, I mean, I think actually, you know what? Let's go back to the panorama image. As yeah, we yeah, sounds good. Um, um, yeah, but I think that was that was kind of the the impetus for both of us. Um, uh, Charlene, the curator, was very she she really wanted us to push, you know, the different mediums we were using, like including. Um, I had never made a video. Sophie has in the past, but I had this was my first video piece, and this was the first time I minted with a uh, with this um, site called uh, Foundation, which is a decentralized application for minting, um, buying, selling NFTs. And what's so interesting is the whole process of just picking um, an application to mint the NFT is almost like thinking about what gallery to show your work. Um, you know, what is the appropriate the context. context? Yeah, yeah, and foundation is invite only, so there's more curation. Yeah. Um, we were working with Lindsay Howard, who obviously has a long history herself curating digital art. Um, and she curated me in the original Philips digital art sale that was pre pre NFT. Um, so that was that was a natural one. Um, but yeah, showing showing NFTs within the fair was interesting. I think we were one of the few booths actually that was using was anyone else showing no with Walter, um, who has been working with digital works for 
a number of years had NFTs associated with her. Oh, they were, they were associated, right? But she wasn't screening them within her space. Yeah. Yeah. No. Um, so, and then also just, I know just formally to talk about the exhibition and the choices of why yeah. we put um, structures and in different sections because this was, so it started, I think something, and maybe people don't know this out there right now, but just how we started with this exhibition, we actually started by creating 3D renders in a space. And the cool thing about being artists who make work digitally and who have 3D files for their works, like my file that you can kind of see on this screen over here, I've got this like, you know, Oh yeah, keep that share going. Um, I'll, show, I'll show the renders. Yeah. Oh, that's a great idea. Oh, that's that's so much fun because I think this is this is the future of proposals for artists mm -hmm. is creating these renders because it it really gives like for example spring break is they have a curation idea which you pitch to so they have this whole you know this year it was heresy hearsay and it was like kind of referencing medieval like themes and and in relationship to contemporary politics so when you pitch they really need to understand how you're going to fit within that and then also how your booth is going to be a standout booth and what that what it's going to kind of look like so sophie and i both were able to take our files and then we were able to then place them in this 3d space and my husband works for advertising companies so he had a quote-unquote like ugly boring office okay, space office space oh that would be a ugly boring office space yeah. job OBJ. Yeah, like Dr. OBJ. So it was so much fun to be able to take that, like, which is kind of what you knew, spring break basic room shape, and transform it in our minds and in this 3D software and think about like what these things mean in relationship and be able to show the curator. Like here's our files and here's a basic idea for my pedestals. Like, cause I had my pedestals made based on a 3D model. And then we were just, we literally just insert, inserted an image of Sophie's um, support structures. And we were playing with the idea of how much contrast we wanted versus how much simplicity. And we ended up going with a little more minimal approach because, which I'm glad we did, because we ended up with the black and white floor and you don't always know which floor you're going to get. Um, but you can see how the show evolved through to the physical iteration. So it's, but it still lives in this space too, which I'm very, I mean, we're very proud of this one too. <laughs> it's like, <laughs> So I'm so curious, when did you find out like what you, what exactly your space would look like? Because that really seems because the the um, the checkered floor, I think, is sort of an interesting thing that that element to your work, because that checkered motif is something that you often see in digital software, like editing software, mm -hmm. you remove an element and that like, you know, checkered um, space is there of course it's in gray not black and white like this but you mm -hmm. you know in a digital it, room like this is. that is yeah. about an entire universe it fits in in a very like neat kind of perfect way so how long did you did you know that you had <laughs> this been a surprise <laughs> yeah yeah we we saw we've seen images of of our space with a prior artist installation and obviously you know part of spring break is these installations aim to be really immersive and wallpapered yeah. um so I think we'd seen it with wallpaper but we yeah we it worked it ended up working and like you said I never thought of that as a kind of Cartesian grid um the xyz grid of 3d software but that makes sense yeah, I mean, we really just tried, it was really, that part was really fun that we didn't quite know what we were gonna get floor wise because we were able to then, once we had that, we knew what we were, we, we could play with that. And we had a minimal palette, which is unusual for spring break. You know, usually you see yeah. lots of I think a lot of people commented just on the contrast. There was a lot of really vibrant, colorful work too this year, a lot of, textiles you know as hyperallergic had, had made a nod to um why that might have been given the circumstances of the past year yeah. um yeah i mean you know we can also i could also talk about how my work has transitioned to a home studio practice this year um, and i think a lot of people made a lot of accommodations but um 
yeah, we we are very, I'm quite, you can see just from what I'm wearing, I'm a little chromophobic in my work, even though I have read the book Chromophobia and I completely, <laughs> have you guys read that book? Uh, it, it, no. It's a book about how, um, you know, monochrome imagery in the art world has come to stand for taste and how that's actually highly exclusionary of uh, many, many other art traditions. So, you know, I'm working on it, but <laughs> um, we were, we had just black and white and then these kind of warm tones in our sculpture. So we kept it a kind of three, um, yeah. Neutral, minimal palette. Minimal and we, palette. we wanted to focus the thing about our works and the reason why that worked for this particular proposal too, is both of our works have a lot of texture in them. Sophie has more of a focus on allowing those print lines um, from 3D printing, the archive of 3D printing to breathe. And so you can see this beautiful archive of the process. My work, I do a lot of additional like digital uh, painting of kind of rocky textures. Yeah, so Sophie, you can see her gorgeous like print lines and they become part of that overall texture. So you're really getting to have that digital connection as well with the physical sculpture. Um, yeah, I love that. Thank you. Yeah, I, I, I embrace them and even more so now and in this new series of bar reliefs, which I'm making at home, it's impossible to eliminate the seam lines and the, the print lines. So it's, it's got to inform the work aesthetically. So I have another I have another sure. question just about the process of making this. So you said that so um, we've looked at some of the renders that you put together. Um, I think like often when I think of curatorial um, practices and like partnerships, I imagine the curator telling the artist, OK, this is going to go here. This is going to go there. Like what? Um, like, so I know that Charlene came up with the, the kind of framework, like yeah. when you were in this space, like, was she um, arranging things with you? Like, what, what exactly yeah. was yeah. a great, well, the, yeah. the nature of the collaboration? She was very, so when, when I made the renders, like the, again, the cool thing about a 3D model is that you can then move things around like a dollhouse. Um, so she was, and that was so exciting and um, activating for her. And so she definitely had a big role in saying, no, I want this over here. And I want, because the formally, we were trying to make this kind of simulated chapel space. So like my wallpaper piece ended up being kind of the altar area and my pedestal ended up being taller we she really wanted them as did I like kind of head height so, yeah and where Sophie's was lower and since mine were more the idols or the the reliquaries um and Sophie's were like more the like the saints and like um yeah. it really, so that was a discussion we continuously had so that was where the collaboration was and then in the booth um, once we installed, she was able to then come in and say, you know, I want, the, you know, we had these discussions, but it was a discussion. It was a collaboration. Like Sophie and I are very hands on. We're very much engaged in our practices and, and especially with a, a very curator slash artist focused fair like spring break. You know, we it's a small booth. We had a lot of work. And um, so we definitely were a big part of that conversation. But in terms of you know, overall overseeing. Um, yeah, that's what she was, she, you know, put in there. In physical space. Yeah. And one thing could, I will say, just because, oh, sorry. I'm <laughs> oh, sorry. It could, oh, could okay. any artist like use, the, the, like figure out the 3D rendering software where you put together the mock-up or? Yeah. Or is it difficult, it like super well, difficult? Yeah, we wouldn't have gained because our sculptures are already digital. I think for somebody working in 3D work, it would be tough. Um, for 2D, it's a little easier. You can just bring in a JPEG of a painting and drag that around the wall. I mean, there's a learning curve to learning 3D. And then the other thing I will say is in my experience as a sculptor who's, I used to teach Maya a long time ago, so I've been using a lot of 3D rendering, lighting, modeling tools for a long time. I used to make meticulous renders of my own solo shows and no matter what, you know, I'd obsess over these renders for a week and then I'd change, step into the space and it would be completely different. It's like being in a video oh, game. 
you know, versus being in your actual house. So, <laughs> so yeah. it has a limited utility, I would say. So yeah. I've usually always changed everything from the renders, but it does help. It absolutely helps. Yeah, and so we're also, not. Oh, sorry. Go oh, ahead. Sorry. We're also. So we're, not, we're so we're not fully. The booth is definitely like the the metaverse, but we're not fully full into like existence type of um, uh, worlds quite yet. Tech's not there and COVID put a real damper on using uh, Oculus or other VR headsets in exhibitions. Oh, Maybe. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, so many people I know who work in VR are not showing VR this year because there's the, you know, even though the fomites and the contact is not such a thing, catching COVID from a surface, but nevertheless, I wouldn't want to put my face in something that someone else's face had just been in. So um, no way. we're going to take a while <laughs> to get back to VR and galleries. Yeah. Yeah, no, definitely. I mean, I think, and, and just back to just like prepping rent. I mean, you can also do a Photoshop collage. Like you don't have to do a yeah. 3D in order it to be a little low attack. Photos of paintings and have a space and like play with that. I mean, there's a lot of ways. I mean, we both teach, I mean, I teach at Pratt and New York Academy of Art. I teach both digital imaging and um, 3D modeling to artists. Um, and I think it's a great tool, but it is it is something you have to be willing to put time in. It was something that I didn't learn initially and learned later in my practice. And it was a huge it was a huge time commitment to it was almost like I had to go back to school for myself. And then, you know, and it was great. Yeah. Actually, it just, uh, you know. Another artist who did that later in his practice is Alex Dodge. Um, he also kind of went back to school, but I didn't go, I didn't actually physically go back to school. I just went to the school of YouTube. Um, oh, you go, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I'm kind of a juror, somebody who's been a juror and on a lot of panels that seeing art, artists submit renders in the actual space is amazing because you have such a limited time to look at imagery and if you can if that person can do the 3d render can do the work for you of imagining their work in your space it does go a long way yeah yeah definitely but yeah so it was so that's kind of just talking about just logistics in terms of like how we set up the show so there was the formal setting it up like a chapel and then there's just always the intuitive thing that happens or just the oh we only have two outlets on this wall so that's where the videos are going <laughs> yeah so can you talk about like some of the challenges you had a little bit because like i do feel like um spring break is this in my estimation, like I think spring break is an amazing opportunity for artists. Um, partially that's because it is set up so that you can work with curators. Um, sometimes mm -hmm. the artists are those curators, but like it mm -hmm. also kind of creates an opportunity for transparency um, in pricing and things like that. So you get to know some of the nuts and bolts and get yeah. used to talking to people um, in that way. And you're also like, just like, you know, right in the thick of it in mm -hmm. the install and these spaces, I think they're all different. Like some of them, I think maybe are a little bit more friendly than others. And mm -hmm. I, you know, I frankly was amazed with the transformation of your booth. Like oh, it you. really looked like you, like if you had handpicked it, like it might have been a little bit larger, I think, if if I had my druthers for your <laughs> yeah for for that. But like, it just seems um, you know so well so well thought out and suited for what you showed. Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, I mean, it was really helpful for us, like to have that very specific. It wasn't like a traditional repeating pattern. It was more like we made it into almost like a drawing. That was an extension of our file. So and images of the wallpaper. Yeah, um, yeah that, that was that was a really. I was I was glad to be have that prompt um, to make something to cover up the the office walls here. This one is uh, this is Colette's. And actually, if you if you lined yourself up just right in the booth, you could see the two sculptures that this was based on. Um, the, uh, you've, oh, you've got them in the background, Colette. Yeah, in your, uh, in your right. 
things oh, changed. Way. <laughs> yeah. And then uh, mine was the uh, the support struts for one of the one of the sculptures. Yeah. I want to do wallpaper again. That was fun. I do too. I mean, like what was so fun too is like we kind of created a workflow together for that because it was it we actually had to take um our 3d files in a 3d piece of software and then we had to take a two-dimensional snapshot of them when they were in wireframe mode and so we had to then export that into illustrator play around with that the density and we so sophie was like okay let's do this um specific like input on the rgb and the um the size of the stroke and so that was really fun to that was where we collaborated so our stroke size mm -hmm. was the same size but the wood the imagery was the imagery. created from oh, our own imagery. stuff but we were able to so that was an interesting way to collaborate and connect on <clears throat> that particular That's medium aesthetic. yeah yeah you know having you know this synergy with another artist where we could be up late at night being like okay are the gas prices low right now for minting our nft and like oh, did, man. Did I pay, i'm willing to pay more now for sleep because i'm too old to do that <laughs> i'm like i'm not gonna stay i'm not gonna stay until 2 a.m to save ten dollars on gas gas prices which if people don't know are the fees what it costs to actually mint an NFT onto the blockchain and, and upload it to the, the interplanetary file system. Um, and it fluctuates wildly based on the market. So um, yeah, just, just for context on that. But yeah, I mean, there was a lot of dialogue to it. And I think maybe the show does just reflect the fact that we were in dialogue so much the months prior. I think not every curator working with a group show has artists who are working together that closely. Thank you. Yeah. And the, like, so you had a kind of altar setup in the in the show. Like, can you talk a little bit about like what um, symbolism was beneath that? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I mean, the idea was trying to create this conceptual devotional space. Um, and my, can you show the panorama? Yeah. Um, so with my piece being that kind of two dimensional vector image of my sculptures layered. So what Charlene really focused on with my um, I had taken an image of my two sculptures together overlapping and she really responded viscerally to that she felt like there was a kind of almost overt kind of sexual overtone in a like kind of um, and so she she wanted the kind of central piece to be those that layered almost like the center kind of the inverse or the subverting of um, Corbet's the origin of the universe. Origin, I was about to say that was her origin of the universe right there. Yeah, yeah, the portal. It was a portal. <laughs> this kind of almost vaginal shape in a very aggressive manner, layered, and that my yeah. work is this very. So she wanted that to be the center of the altar. And then my two kind of lectern like um, structures were where, you know, this kind of where you've got these these meaning making or this these these symbolic looking talismans that are just asking you to project meaning. And and, you know, because that's what's so my work personally deals with a lot of thinking about the origins of belief systems in our you know as humans and and just that kind of space in our minds that very human space in our minds that um that really kind of really drives everything it drives kind of how we perceive the world and this one on the left here my most recent one is really inspired by ancient antiquity or ancient armors um and and thinking about what would armor look like in the future and how do we filter out the world? So thinking about filters in relationship with belief systems, since we're so, we now have two lives. We have one physical life and we have our social media lives now. And those are no longer, you know, kind of the social media life, if, especially if you're a creator and artist, it is definitely something that is just as vibrant and robust um, and, and active. Um, and so just thinking about, well, how do we, yeah, how do we, 
how do we prevent ourselves from being kind of misinformed or getting swept into these new types of cults and these new types of beliefs. And, and, you know, um, so it's kind of playing with almost, you know, flipping it, like creating our own symbols, our own, um, uh, archetypes, but also playing with some of those and remixing and reanimating those from the past. And I use um, open source scans um, from um, a site called uh, My Mini Factory that has a whole series of works called Scan the World. And Scan the World is an incredible tool um, where scanners from all over the world scan um, artifacts. And I also, I do let some print lines breathe, but I'm, I do a lot of melting, sanding, burning, you know, patinating, painting, and I bring my painting background into my physical and digital sculpting processes. And it gives me quite a lot of joy because it's, it's so tactile. Yeah. So that's... Um does that make sense about just the kind of the, the idea of the chapel and then, um, yeah. And then Sophie's work, if we can go back to Sophie, Sophie, your machines for suffering or one yeah. of you. Yeah, about. yeah, yeah. I mean, that was, you know, another thing that I think Charlene really wanted me to yeah. emphasize was the religious kind of imagery and overtones and um, which is never something that I really explicitly wanted to talk about as a kind of, third generation atheist in my work but um you know like this piece in particular it's called uh period des attitudes passionelle and um comes from my research into hysteria which probably most people know now it's now discounted was once um for many centuries actually uh applied to women and there's a particular phase of the attack which was invented basically this this structure of this attack of hysteria was all these different poses there's a um was invented by dr jean martin chacot at the salpetria asylum in paris and he had this performance script i mean it's a choreography basically for all the poses that the women would go through um and he had all the stages numbered and uh if they didn't perform it on cue, they it's okay because you could electrocute them and get them to do it on the stage during these teaching lectures so I mean, a really, really horrific history. Um, but there's there's a particular stage where they go through this sort of religious supplication and they're praying and the kind of hands are up. And that's the gesture that I was using in this bar relief and then in some subsequent sculpture too. Um, and I'm just trying to find, yeah, here's Machines for Suffering. Yeah, this is another pose um, from... Um, from that same document. So the, the kind of overtones of the pathologization of religious ecstasy, we had one long text thread last one night, I remember talking about like pathologizing ecstasy and like Charcot was really into religious imagery. Um, there, obviously there is an intersection between religion and mental illness where certain, you know, people in the throes of a really significant break from reality might have religious delusions if that has been there upbringing and they they kind of will seize onto these things so th these were all conversations um that came up during during that curatorial process yeah the whole idea of religious melancholia being mm. uh, really it's something where and i think there's kind of sometimes that's happening too in both the extreme right and the extreme left this like like the people who are afraid of vaccines and like what the, that they're just absorbing this fear that any little thing they do off track of that belief system that they're going to be, you know, somehow, you know, not thriving. And it's, um, and I think that's what I was, I've been always fascinated with religious melancholia because it's just so interesting because I, as a child kind of suffered from a light case of that, even though I was not raised a religion, I was, fascinated by belief systems as a little a little kid and my my parents who are staying here now they thought it was so odd I wanted a bible I wanted to understand I wanted to go to catholic school I wanted to see I also loved all the icons and the symbols and the imagery and and so I was I was just once I started learning about it I was like it was just like anxiety incarnate like worrying oh are you doing this wrong are you doing that wrong are you doing you know and there's this kind of this new type of um, religion out there, like it, within social media, if you say the wrong thing, do the wrong thing, like you're gonna, you know. So that's, it's also interesting out there right now. Um, so that this show felt kind of 
timely in these discussions felt like timely as well. I mean, yeah. I think the interesting thing about the way like religion tends, you know, runs through some of this stuff, it, like has to do with um, it's like almost it, it's durability um, because like there's, a, a, you know, it exists. There's a very kind of strong religion as it relates to tech. And we use that term kind of loosely, but there is, a, you know, um, people really kind of worship technology and believe, and it, it's also very, I think like if you look at Christianity, um, especially the iconography uh, associated with it, but it's very tied to the fragility of the human body. And mm -hmm. that makes a lot of sense because during the time, like during the time that the passages in the Bible and the gospels were written, like these yeah. were not times when people lived very long. They yeah. had very short lifespans that this was not a good life for a lot of people. You know, yeah. just basic things like vaccines had not yet been invented. Oh, and it made total sense to believe in a random and vengeful God whose motive you couldn't even comprehend, you know, begin to comprehend. Yeah. And now I think like with um, technology, I, and like the new world that we're living in, like we are again, very concerned with the fragility of the human body. And like part of that has to do with like um, crumbling infrastructure and how that impacts our bodies physically. We, mm -hmm. It has to do with our use of, yeah, it has to do with the climate. It has to do with our use of technology, how it separates us from the body and how it impacts the body. Like if you spend 10 hours a day sitting at a desk, your body is not going to um, be very healthy for that long, right? Well, like, so there's all sorts of ways that this new world is impacting our bodies, separating us from them and um, making us more aware still of our fragility. And I think that it's very interesting that these, that your work so specifically touches on those themes in both cases like Colette like it's so fascinating to me to see that like the need for protection right like this shield mm -hmm. from the forces of social media or whatever it is like Sophie in your work like the breakdown of the body mm -hmm. and the breakdown mm -hmm. of the spirit like and, yeah. and also it's reconstruction right so mm -hmm. like in all of these form, yeah all of these things, like, I feel like, you know, on the one hand, they, they relate um, to religion, even, even if they're not, I don't even feel that they're explicitly. espousing, yeah. Yeah. I don't think they're espousing a belief in ever, everlasting life. If anything, I think there's kind of a questioning of, like, no, absolutely. Um, yeah, you know, how far yeah. this stuff goes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. We were just talking about this last night because the entire kind of the foundation of my work is the process of 3D laser scanning and the particular scanner that I use and love um, was designed for props and architecture and it was not designed for people. And so when you try to capture a moving person, um, it really kind of shatters. And so there's, I, I think, a lot about the ways the blind spots in the design of the technologies that we use, how they weren't meant to kind of accommodate us in um in certain ways and I mean you know it I also think about things like how the inherent biases in cinematic film how that was designed to expose light skin properly you know like um my my scanner and my whole I feel like my whole project over the course of my career has been to look at the ways that technology breaks and fails and how you can reconstruct that after the fact, this kind of forensic archive of these fragments. So I think there's also a sense when, you know, we're talking about the past Colette, but there's also this kind of implied future time scale mm -hmm. where there might be some kind of archeological artifact that's unearthed. You know, we've left behind this like chunk of painted plastic and people are puzzling over, you know, um, what that is. And, and also in, the, in a lot of shows I've used kind of the language of museum display and so like the language of the kind of fragment and the partial incomplete evidence. So yeah, all, all of that is to say, I think there's a, like a very 
um, an approach that is really questioning technology and trying to be as critical as possible in thinking about its implicit assumptions and its design. Yeah. I, and I also think that that negative space that you have in your work, Sophie, where she's actually going into the software and deleting polygons mm. and removing and playing with that disembodied figure um, really relates to the experience of being in social on social media and like what you present and and then also just yeah this kind of feminist angle of what you know historically has been done to women's body and what is currently being done to women's bodies um my work doesn't deal as much with the body but sophie's definitely directly deals with it um you know, I, there was, I didn't tell you this, Sophie, hot, hot take, hot information, but there was a gentleman, I don't know if he was a gentleman, a man that came into the booth and started telling me how your sculpture should be. Oh, thanks. Yeah. yeah. Very that was really nice. Of you. <laughs> I'm not, my sarcasm was not thanking you sarcastically. It was thinking this, yeah, the mansplainer. Oh, no, I get that. Yeah. What, 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 he was like, there should be talons on the top of these structures coming through the figure. Oh, get, get right on that. Yeah. 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 <laughs> and like, I was no, like, you know what? He got it because this piece is trying to, it's, it's defining that space, owning that space and that history and talking about future possibilities and reconstruction. Like Patty was saying, I really like that, the deconstruction and reconstruction. And he mm -hmm. made him uncomfortable. So he wanted to say what it should be because, right. yeah. Right. I, yeah, I'm telling him he can submit, he can yeah. submit feedback. We'll get, our agents will get right back to you, three to five business days. Um, <laughs> no, I mean, I should also say, you know, in, in the work that I'm looking at that is, you know, is around kind of like bodily fragility and also looking at, in this case, it's about the history of psychiatry, but I've had, you know, other projects that are more broadly about the history of medicine. Like I do come from a background of um, having been disabled. I don't currently identify as a, as a person with a disability because I, I am in remission, but I was very ill with chronic fatigue syndrome for many years um, in my 20s and really couldn't work. And actually really interesting to talk about digital art and the net in relationship to accessibility because I used to be a photographer and when I got sick, I couldn't carry my stuff anymore. So I had to work in front of a computer. Um, also really interesting, I keep segueing, but um, you know, remote exhibitions and digital exhibitions have actually opened up tons of avenues in terms of looking at accessibility for people with mobility issues who can't get to galleries and museums. So. Um, Anyway, like I, you know, thinking about illness and thinking about misunderstandings of illness too has been like a real thread going through my my thinking about my work. And I, I also, and this is why maybe we've had so many conversations, but I think it relates to our um, interest in antiquated medical practices and pseudosciences mm. and how they affect, you know, perspectives to this day. Um, and you know, just oh, I, science. we talked a yeah, lot about science. Yeah. Personal background with family members that have had neurological issues um, and concerns that have really affected personalities and 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 then also another set of family members that are in a cult. So it's you know it's very interesting to see how um, how those things affect our day to day. That's maybe this is why I have such a focus on the head now. Um, probably. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, yeah, I think, but I also, I know we're getting close to the hour. I wanted yeah. to bring it back to just this idea of what Sophie was just bringing up about remote connections and the possibilities when you're either working with um, a disability or you are also working with some sort of restriction or limitation, whether you're in a different place, a remote, you're in a, a state or a country where you don't have a lot of artists around you or an art community that you feel like-minded with. There's something I found it personally, I live in New York City, I live in Queens, but I am a diehard homebody who has my studio practice in my home and a, a gardener. And so I really appreciate having connections with other artists and like studio visits with other artists in my space. Um, and that was not something that was 
considered acceptable before the pandemic. Um, so I, that is the part that has really been very helpful and opened things up to me. And also just Sophie in general, just, it's like, I don't, I think we take for granted how much, you know, having art communities and also other artists who help activate our brains and our practices. Um, and that's very much important to me, even though, you know, I work solo in my studio. I really, really love having those activating conversations. Um, yeah. Again, I, mean, I think we started, I know I started seeking out these calls because I was like trapped in my home with my children for a year. <laughs> who I adore, but, you know, I had a studio, I was at the Elizabeth Foundation, I was going into Times Square every day and that all got moved outside unseen and we were in Australia and so, like, I, I lasted a few months as just a, like, kindergarten teacher doing remote schooling and then I was like, I am just going to completely lose it. I cannot, you know, I need to find a way to continue that community in some way. Um, and weirdly enough, I feel like we've come out of this year and I hate saying it because it's, you know, so many other, like I acknowledge how immensely privileged I am to have made it this point through to the pandemic and we didn't lose anybody, you know, all of these um, other disclaimers, but I feel at this, this one element of our lives, the kind of the digital art community feels stronger, at least for me, and I feel more networked now um which has been like an unexpected silver lining me too i did not expect this so that is the one thing so we were so happy that we were able to like actually take all those conversations and and build it into something and get a curator involved and have her um you know conceptual overlay um with that project yeah yeah I mean, I actually, this is, this is related slightly aside, but I do feel like one of the things that it's it's really done is been able to connect people from different parts of the country too, because like, you know, I've been on all kinds of Zooms where people are, are tuning in from different time zones. And that was something that I think we, it was a place where we were heading but it was yeah. not necessarily a place where we were. Yeah. And I think it, you know, from my perspective, it was a place that we had to get to, you know, mm -hmm. I've been working on a, on a, a book that was on um, defunct artist spaces across the, the country as sort of a means of um, looking at our different artist communities and also like um, showing what we all have in common and I think in a lot of ways, some of the stuff that happens with the membership that I run network mm. is what I want, you know, what I'm hoping to see is really to see these connections of people doing very serious work yeah. all over the country. Yeah. And that's, you know, it's a, it's another thing that happens. Um, it's, I think it is what we lost a little bit when we lost the art fairs mm. um, because they bring people together Oh, yes. And we, we appreciated that about spring break, you know, I think having not done a fair like that. And I mean, also, you know, the, the limited times I had something at Armory, you know, years and years ago, but you don't get to spend the time in the booth in the same way. And you often, you know, you don't walk around the Armory and see the artist next to every work. No. There's, um, this was like much more direct, much more kind of full contact. So, um, you know, that we all... Um, we really appreciated that about spring break in particular. Yeah. And yeah. we have like Sophie and I uh, kind of separate out of it. Um, we are launching um, a couple or we're dropping a couple new uh, 3D files with foundation uh, where you can actually use AR when viewing them and kind of project them onto whatever space you have. So that's something um, Sophie's done that before yeah. with feral file. Um, do you want to screen share yours? Yeah, let, me, uh, let me get that up. Yeah, but I, we also want to hear about your upcoming book and anything else you want to share, Patty, as well. Oh, absolutely. We, I mean, we can do it. We can uh, talk about some of that stuff after we look at the, uh, sure, um, yeah. the files. I will share. Um, so this is, and just for anybody who doesn't know kind of what it looks like to be on a 
um, NFT platform. So this is foundation. So again, it's like you have your own page here. And this was the video that we showed earlier. You can see how much it sold for, who it was bought by, and that's all on the blockchain, but that's very transparent in the NFT space, which that's, that is something I really like. This is the piece that's um, the 3D file that was actually in the video. And you can actually see that I digitally signed it. It's a oh, even, signed, yeah. yeah. So, um, and, and I- that you know, can be viewed in augmented reality as well, but on a mobile device, not on a desktop. So yeah, you can install it in wherever you want to, which is really fun for a sculptor. Right. And then um, Sophie has this absolutely gorgeous piece. And this is in conjunction with Foundation has put out a call called New Dimensions. And they're trying to get more artists using 3D to kind of show these pieces in different contexts in AR. So like, because there's so many artists using 3D um, that have these gorgeous 3D files that they can, they can share, so. That's amazing. That's mm -hmm. really, really amazing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's it's fun. It's it's so fun as a sculpture because when you have a piece in AR on a mobile device, you can you get back that physicality that I think you lose when looking at work sitting on a screen. So you can walk around it and you can look up and look down, and you're actually engaging it with it with your body in a room in a space in the way that same way that you would as a sculpture. Right. So it's not something we can demo on our desktop, but it's something that viewers can, um, if they go to foundation.app on their mobile devices, they can yeah. play with any of the three files. I highly recommend. Um, yeah, so that's pretty cool because it's something when I teach and when I'm, when I'm sharing, like I'll just share it really quickly and then I know we need to, we're getting close to the end here. But when I teach, one of the coolest things I loved showing for artists that hadn't used 3D was just, the fact that you can move around these files and that you can sculpt with symmetry. So there was something so tactile about that when you kind of zoom in on a file and then you can kind of sculpt on it or, or dig into it. And I think this, this new kind of having, like with foundation, having the ability to move around the file gives that physical feeling that I feel when I'm sculpting and that that then is getting translated for other people um, with the work. So I'm, it's very exciting. That's one of the reasons why I'm getting into NFTs too, is just taking those files and extending them into this other medium where people can interact with them just the way I'd want somebody to interact you know, with an actual physical piece in a, in a physical space. So yeah, those are dropping tomorrow. So that's the newest. Oh, that's great news. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, what's happening with this book? You've got a book coming up. Well, be, you know, it, um, before we get to that, I did want to know one thing. I just wanted to thank, um, Charlene, she's not here, but I think she was actually the person who suggested we do this. Um, oh, and yeah. you know, when when we were in the uh, in in the booth together, and I wanted to thank um, both of you because, like, um, th there's no reason that anybody else would know this, but like, I spent probably three and a half hours in spring break while I was there, which is a very long time to spend. Okay. But I probably spent 45 minutes in your booth alone, yeah. which was really, I know, right? Which is a long time for yeah. any booth. But it was really, really, like there was a lot there. It was really fun. Um, and it's been really nice to extend the conversation a little bit and be able to dig into the work. Because one mm -hmm. thing that does... Um, it, it can be a problem at these fairs is even when you're there for a long time, there's a lot of distractions. It's, yeah. you know, it requires um, quite a bit to, um, to really get everything. So it's been a, like a real privilege in my estimation to be able to yeah. talk to both of you um, about the work a little bit more. Um, and that's been really exciting. The thing um, with my book um, that's coming out 
Probably in a couple months. This is the Houston edition. I've been working with um, Pete Gershorn about this uh, uh, on this for about a year and a half, two years. And mm -hmm. it's a full like 200 pages of um, defunct wow. and active artist run spaces in the Houston area. It's a full history mm -hmm. um, and pretty exhaustive. And I feel like these are the types of books that are really, they're not really being written. And I think they are important because it's a history that gets lost, right? Absolutely. Like these, these are projects. And I actually feel like there's, there's, there's an issue overall with artist led projects where the archiving um, yeah. becomes real problematic because a lot of the projects that we do out of love we don't necessarily have the, you know, the funds to take care of the archiving, which is why I, um, you know, don't have that like museum filing cabinet with the images of every show that ever happened under that roof. You know, it's it's much more ephemeral. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I think like one one of the things that you guys did an amazing job with was the documentation of the of your booth, right? Because that's exactly. one of the things. That I see most commonly actually is is people who have not considered the the documentation because they get burnt out through the installation process, mm -hmm. and then for one reason or another they don't get good install shots, and then this thing that they put all sorts of work in like they can't capitalize they on have it. A record, yeah. It's one advantage of having an undergrad photography degree yeah, is so I like the, have so the gear and the lights and stuff. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it, it just makes a huge difference. I, I will say that the booth is a tad smaller than it looked in the photograph. It is. The lenses, the wide angle. Yeah. It, it, it was we need a museum. We need a museum for yeah. this exhibition. Like, think about what we could do with these concepts and with this mindset. Yeah. yeah, 200 times as much yeah. space, yeah. But thank you, I mean, we were so thrilled and like both slightly nervous that, you know, that you wanted to um, be on our channel and have this conversation with us and really, really grateful for all of those insights. Yeah. Um, I think we really oh, it's, went ahead with a lot of it. So thank it's, you. It's been so much fun. And, you know, one last plug. Um, Sophie, yeah. I think you are part of the membership that I run um, Network, which, yeah, which is part of the workshop program. Um, mm -hmm. We're going to be reopening the doors up very soon, probably next week. Uh, um, cool. It's been so, so valuable. Yeah, I've been really, really benefiting from it. In the description for Network and Workshop. Yeah, the, mem yeah, the membership program, um, which is the flagship program of Workshop, um, which is called Network, is um, a program that helps the artists get the show's residencies and grants of their dreams. And we do that through um, group coaching, community building, um, asset reviews, um, you know, guest speakers, and we're building it as we speak. It's been in existence for four months. So the founding members have been really, I think, kind of critical in shaping this program. It's really, it's kind of exciting how it's how it's all evolving. Yeah. So. I'm, I'm really excited to see the um, the direction it heads in, but it's been so useful for me so far with career. Yeah. Development. All of the things that you are never taught in school and you're lucky if somebody kind of like tells you at a party, you know. Yeah. <laughs> Experience. I mean, like you really have been so you know, present in the art world for a while. And so it's like, and, and the thing about the art world is, and this is, and maybe this is why I got so connected with maker spaces and, and technology is the art world is very opaque and it's very hard yes. to navigate and it's designed like that to create more worth and value around certain artists um, so that, you know, I mean, that's kind of exclusivity, yeah. And so it becomes very difficult if you're new or even if you're not new and you just, I mean, I've had times where it's like, you just need a new voice to kind of oversee what you're doing and what your goals are, or to like, even just have that conversation about your goals and put yourself out there and connect with others who are trying to achieve certain goals. I think it's so important to have these types of uh, structures for artists to have, you know, with all the resources that you're providing and, you know, the community as well. So I think it's awesome what you're doing. Um, yeah. And, uh, yeah. So thank you. Well, 
thank you very much. Um, it's like, yeah, it's exciting to be building this and it's exciting to be here. So thanks so much for the invite. Um, oh, and it, you yeah. know, I love the, I love the um, series and I especially love the name. It's very, mm -hmm. it's yeah. really clever. I just realized that my mom in the 80s and 90s had a band called Not On File and then uh, then we've just started filing. <laughs> <laughs> I think that ties it all together.